Um, and so when creators express interest on Poplar, they then are asked if they are, um, are accepted to submit a concept. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we've now run about 19 campaigns, even though we started in recently, we've grown really fast. Um, so we've managed to get really huge brands on board, like L'Oreal, YSL. Um, we had Universal Music uh, for Big Shack. We had Sony Music. We've had Warner Brothers. We've had William Hill, which is a gambling company here. We've had RB for Optrex. So we're doing really well, and there's going to be more and more brands joining us um, and asking for concepts from creators. We do pay 50 pounds. Um, we are going to blend the concepting and the technical specification phase because it wasn't super clear how are you doing that before. But I'd love to hear your feedback after this. Um, also, please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask me questions, and I'll be more interactive than me just blabbing around for an hour. So don't hesitate. Uh, but once you submit a concept on the platform, there are fields to fill when you click on the right link. And you can submit um, Photoshop, Wireframe, or Sketch on there. And we'll show that to the brand and get their feedback. And that's what we use to basically choose the winners who are then put into production. So without further ado, um, I would mention three kinds of concepts that we kind of expect or the things that have worked the most when we have talked to the brands. The first one is a sort of sketch. So that's a basic, really old format in advertising. Um, just sketching something with a pencil or with your computer to illustrate something that you're trying to achieve. Um, the next one would be a storyboard, so it's more advanced, but it kind of conveys the different steps that you'll be taking or that the user will be taking when using the, uh, the filter. So that's a really cool way um, to do that, and that could be either through sketching or a computer or through Photoshop. And then the last one, which would be a, a wireframe where you sort of like indicate where the template will be and, and what content will go into each of these buckets. Um, so it's more about what you're comfortable with, how much time you have, you know, what skills you have. If you feel you don't draw really well and you're better with Photoshop, then that's another uh, way of doing it. You can do color. It's really more about conveying the idea in a really clear way so that the brand will understand uh, what you're offering and will not have to go back to you several times. So this is an example of a uh, sketch that we got from one of our creators. This is our business card. I don't know if you've seen the teaser for that. Um, it works really well. Basically, you could use the image or target um, tracker functionality in Facebook to scan our business card, and it opens up a whole AR experience. Um, so that's the sort of sketch that he did, which we found really clear. And then after that, he spent, sent us some example of textures and uh, 3D objects that he'd be sourcing from a library um, that he paid for. Actually, I think he paid $40. So this is Huang, our, our creator in Taiwan, who did that. Um, and that was a really cool way to present the concept. Another example of sketch. Um, so that was for Big Shack. And um, this is from, she's kind of like, didn't have that much time. She was attending an event, I think, so she kind of put some drawings together and then added some text around it to kind of present her idea. So on the left side, you can see sketch slash storyboard for a face lens. And on the right side, you can see, um, see it for the portal side of things. Again, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions on that. Um, this is from Tom. So we really tend to love all of his uh, concepts. They're usually very similar to this. Um, it's one image. It's a uh, Photoshop image that presents the iterations of what you'll see on the screen. Um, for this one, for Big Shock, people who don't know Big Shock, uh, Michael Dapper, he's an uh, urban artist here in the UK. He's quite big uh, to create a face filter with another uh, world effect taking place with a back camera, so a dual filter. Um, and this is this was the concept from Tom. So not only drawings um, of what would happen on the screen, but also explain the animations and gesture recognition of the head um, and other, another couple elements, especially the music, which is also always super important for us because it adds a lot of, uh, of life to the filter, um, makes it you know better for the user. 
Um, we used to, we tend to use about 15 max seconds of music, either from the brand that the brand's provided um, or that the creator has sourced from a library, either it's license free or he's paid for it, or even some creators like to produce their own music or sound effects. Um, another one for Big Shack, uh, this one's very CGI type uh, concept. The one on the right we quite liked, it's a Waka Shack example. Um, Chris, is that yours actually? I don't know if you're still on there, sorry. I can't see you guys by the way. <clears throat> that wasn't ours. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, yeah, very clear um, what's happening and what, what's proposed on here. And so you could see the, the screen uh, displays in the text. This is actually the winning concept. So um, that's a big reveal. I hope the creators don't mind us sharing that information, by the way. But um, I think it's really good for us to share who's won and why. Um, so this was done by Mark Wakefield and his brother Ross Wakefield. Um, on the front camera, you could see the, and, and one thing I would mention is a lot of the concepts can be similar at times especially for this one, because for the face filter, it was a bit obvious what we wanted, which is be in Big Shaq's sort of like jacket and hat and whatnot. So I don't want to talk about intellectual property and, and those sort of questions, because I don't think we have that much time. I'm happy to talk about it more towards the end and get your feedback on it. Um, I think there's a big question around concepting and who owns the concept IP and, what, and how do you address those things? We've had a question from a creator before because the end results, this project actually was quite similar to theirs. And actually this one was sent before the concept. So that was one way to address it. Um, but it's always gonna be very difficult to address. So we have to look for things that are very differenti differentiated from other concepts. In this one, uh, the guys kind of demoed their 3D expertise to do the world effects for the back camera and then they even did little demo videos here. Um, hopefully my screen will play this. So as you can see, they did a very quick mock-up um, of the two dancers and what it would look like uh, very early, early on and shot a video for the client. I, I kind of think that kind of sold it for the client because they were really able to see, and this is actually quite close to the final attraction. I don't know if you've tried the, the filter, um, but it's kind of like well, what's, what it looks like. So let me just go back to my presentation, sorry. Um, they did that for the face filter as well. So this is the one that Universal Music decided to go with. And this is there you go. Um, any questions about this particular project before I move on to another project? Nope. Okay, hopefully everyone's still there. I can't see you guys. I can just see my screen, so I'll keep going. Um, so moving on to another project. So this was uh, for L'Oreal Paris in Canada. We run a campaign for the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, this was in September. Um, so the concepting phase started in August and production took place in August as well. Uh, this is a concept for Ben. Uh, very sort of like interesting way to, to Photoshop it with, you know, the film and whatnot. So you can see the creator made a little bit extra effort to talk to the brand about the environment of the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, and then illustrating the, uh, this was also dual camera. So on the front camera, you had a face filter where you could pretend to be photographed by paparazzi. And on the rear camera, it was a portal where you're stepping onto the red carpet. And that on the brief, we were looking for creators to send um, more propositions on how they're going to achieve that and um, what they were proposing exactly. Uh, so this is the um, the winning one, and um, you could see um, on the left side. There's quite a lot of text here. Sorry, but I collated. These are actually four different slides that I put into one. 
Um, but that was, so it was quite easy to understand for the brands. Uh, on the top left, you have the portal proposal um, where the user can look around and they were offering to do these cutouts for the, for the audience around the red carpet. You can see the L'Oreal booth towards the end. Um, you're kind of walk through the red carpet and can look around. And then when you get to the end of the red carpet, you can flip the camera for the CTA. And then you can take your picture taken um, off by the paparazzi. You can see that on the right side. Um, the end project was very similar to this again. The added bonus um, was that he, they kind of explained um, what textures they were going to use and like the gold dust effects, the cutouts, like I said. Um, what um, they were going to use to model the, the assets, so Maya, um, how they would use AR Studio, et cetera. So just a lot of information on here that's really relevant for the brand and makes them feel very comfortable. And of course, we're always here to also answer the brand's question. It's not, we just don't send that straight to the brand. We also talk to them about the proposal. Um, so it's always best also to chat to us. Just to mention, we have a Slack channel. If you haven't received the email, uh, please ping us after this. But it's a really efficient way to communicate with us. Uh, you can just ping us privately on the Slack channel, or we also have a community chat on there where we announce briefs and talk about other stuff. So that was the end product, and as you can see, very similar to the concept, um, and the brand was super happy with that one. Cool. Any questions about the L'Oreal project? OK, so I'll move on to King. Um, so King is, at present, one of our biggest customers. Um, they approached us through Snapchat for a campaign around Candy Crush and Farm Hero Saga. Uh, two really big games for them. Um, for L'Oreal and for Universal, the angle for them was more to generate impressions. Um, and they approached that for through a delivery through Facebook, so using AR Studio to produce and then to deliver on the Facebook and be linked to their pages. That actually resulted in 6 million impressions for Big Shack because his page is quite big, and he got reposted by users. Um, so that's quite a good strategy for some brands that don't necessarily have Snapchat presence. King uh, does have a strong Snapchat presence, and they like to spend media on top of the content creation. So systematically, when we produce stuff for them through the creators, they'll then add a download now button to uh, Media Buy. Uh, that will then redirect to the App Store so that users can download the Candy Crush app or the uh, Farm Hero Saga app. So for them, it's really important to generate filters that have a gamification sort of effect, but also that are not too complex. So I think some of the learnings there um, from what we've done is like try to concept stuff that's rather simple but efficient in um, creating engagement for users. And this is an example from Ua in Germany. Um, where the candy was falling and you would catch it with your mouth open. This is actually published and live now on Snapchat if you want to try it. Um, I can also snap, send snap codes if you want to try any of these. If you can't find them, we're happy to share them on the Slack or through email. Um, they loved how it kind of distorted the face and made it really shareable for people um, who would, like took pictures and shared with their friends or shot videos and themselves uh, doing it, but especially made them feel the fun, quirky, magical environment of uh, Candy Crush that makes you want to download the app after that. Uh, we're actually still waiting on the results, so uh, they're really, really happy with that. And um, Snapchat's been showing it to a lot of people internally as like a sort of like best case. Uh, again, I can share the resulting uh, thing for that. But as you can see, the concept is really simple. Uh, it's a mix of Sketch and, and sort of like Photoshop. Uh, this is another example from Christian uh, with a pinata. Uh, Christian does really good ones as well in Photoshop. Uh, Christian, if you are on the call, I can't see you, but you're welcome to add more information. Uh, this one was around tilting your head to hit the pinata and get candies released. I believe it's still in production, but um, will still soon be published. 
as we're waiting for feedback from King. Um, so yeah, just text explaining what's happening and a lot of simple photos uh, with uh, animations. Another winning concept was from uh, Adrian and Baptiste uh, in France. So this is another game where you tilt your head to jump around the platforms um, and you're embodying a character. They actually fed us back after that that they didn't want users to be in a character's body. Um, they would rather focus on the candies and the game mechanism. So we kind of switch the body afterwards. Uh, but very good concept here. Uh, you get the preview image on here. Uh, they explain the stages of the game, the challenge, the time trial, uh, the bonuses, call to actions, and, uh, and other types of information on here. Um, this is also soon to be released. Um, and then another winning concept for Farm Hero Saga from uh, Tom in Holland. Uh, very good concept again with very clear uh, photos. He talks also about the music and uh, sound effects. There's an app bonus here. Um, explains really well the, the game mechanisms. Um, if the creators are happy for me to share those separately, I'm happy to go through Slack or other means. Um, if you want that, just email or Slack us, and I'll ask the creators. I think I have a demo video coming. Um, and yeah, and the camera flips to a, a weld effect, and this was sort of like an added functionality he added to the concept. So very fun game. You can see myself on there. Um, that's now live, I believe. And again, we can share the snap code if you want to try it for yourself. Moving on to William Hill. So they have a lot of stuff happening in the sports arena, um, whether it's UFC or boxing or other. Um, so very good concept here that explain the kind of like cutouts, um, wearing the belts on your shoulder. Funny enough, there were some issues with going from concept to production because of the download now button that you can see there uh, being kind of like sunk in. But also, one really important thing we learned is uh, having to take a selfie or, or try snaps uh, through your, your phone. You have to be quite at a distance with your arm to be able to see your, the full extent of your body. So the belt on the shoulder wasn't very visible, actually. Um, because people were too close during the selfie mode. So we ended up taking out the, the bottom layers of um, McGregor and, and Khabib on there and then moving them to the upper uh, part of the screen so that you could see the full body of the user and can see the, the belt in full effect. Um, so that's definitely a good learning. Uh, they also wanted the logo systematically on the top left as well. Um, and the download now button for performance marketing, which Snap has for their clients, that people can now buy at auction, had a lot of issues also um, with various phones where the button was then appearing on top of the carousel of the Snap effects. So something to keep in mind that we're not asking creators is can you mock up a fake download now button on your concepts and during production that will then remove when we publish the effect to show the brand where it's going to appear and reassure them, but also try to um, demo the effect on as many devices as possible because because of the different screen ratios, there's been issue also with that. So whether it's an iPhone 10 or 7 or 8, like all changes. Um, and then, of course, Android and tablets all have different ratios. So if you are able to demo those, we try to do that at Poplar as well, but it's always good if the creator can try those. And, of course, there's an emulator on Snap and Facebook where you can check out some of the screens, but not all of them, unfortunately. Um, another learning for this is the blue um, was taken out. And we now usually prefer not having any background for clients. Um, it can be quite immersive and cool to have backgrounds, whether it's video or images, uh, but actually creates a lot of issues with segmentation, as some of you creators know. Um, and some of the brands just prefer for users to have their own environment because it makes it more shareable. Uh, so there's something else to keep in mind for best practices. 
Um, and then Jack in Brighton um, really likes showing his face and doing little demo videos. So this was his concept, his like early concept. It didn't end up going uh, looking like this. Actually, the gloves look more real in the end product, which is also live on Snapchat. So you can check that. Actually, I have a video here I can demo. This is for another brand. So this is for um, RB Optrex uh, for screen eyes. So this was his concept, and that makes it. And then he has a bit of text and images as well to uh, explain how he's going to do that. But as you can see, you can easily do some demos. It doesn't take that much time, and it kind of like gives a really better idea uh, for the brand, especially because, like I said in the beginning, AR is really hard to understand just with a piece of paper or an image. Um, so these are really good ways to demo that to the brand too. Um, and take off the presentation and kind of like interact if anyone wants to talk about stuff. Uh, if you are shy and don't want to talk about stuff, you're welcome to email me at david at Poplar Studio. Or like I said, we have the Slack channel where you can select the whole team. I'm going to go back to my screen now. Uh, hi, David. Hey, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, what type of software uh, do you guys uh, use mostly for AR, or what is uh, needed? I'm not really familiar with uh, AR, but I'm keen to learn. Yeah, of course. Um, so most of the creators who work on Facebook will use uh, Facebook AR Studio. It's now called Spark AR, and you can download it for free uh, from the internet. There's a Facebook community group also that most of the creators on our, our job have joined from here. So um, I would encourage you to join that community group and chat with the Facebook creators on there, as well as our Slack group. Um, for Snapchat, people use what's called Snap Lens Studio. Again, you can download that and uh, try it out. From what creators told tell us, it's quite easy to understand, especially if you have 3D experience. You can import your 3D models like from Maya Blender and other types of software. Um, seeing comments there, Slack should have a list. Of, I didn't see the end of that comment, sorry. Uh, but if you guys want to talk, that'd be super helpful. Um, yeah, so Mike, I, I'd encourage you to check out Snapchat Lens Studio and Facebook AR Studio for those two platforms. And then for Instagram, they're going to be using Spark AR as well. We think it's a, diff a slightly different software than for Facebook. Um, we don't think it's going to be the same one publishing to both platforms. If anyone has more information on this and want to comment, let me know. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ed. So in the chat, I saw that uh, someone was asking, um, and I seconded it on, um, there should be, a, like in the Slack, there should be a list of the published QR codes of the projects that gone through. Yeah, we could do that for sure. Uh, we could also do that on our website. Uh, we've just started a blog, so we can put stuff on there. Um, on the Slack, we will create a channel for uh, published projects. And then as they become published, we will share SNAP codes. One thing to know is if a SNAP um, is sponsored, where they uh, have media and they have a download now button, usually it expires after a week. Um, so we're trying to see if the brands are OK with us also uploading a community lens, uh, because community lens don't expire. So, um, so hopefully, we can share those snap codes. But sometimes, it's up to the brand if they want the snap codes to still be available past the media campaign or not. OK. And can you give uh, an idea of the range of price of what a creator can expect from a single lens? Sure. So obviously, this is a very contentious subject um, because we work with a diversity of content creators from Freelancers, you know, guys that are just out of school that have worked in gaming development school and then are now sort of launching on their own, um, that might charge less money because they don't have access to brands and they're really happy working with us, all the way to small to medium agencies that we can work with who have a lot of, you know, more employees and have to pay those employees and are used to charging more money. Um, I just want to specify before I answer that question, like our goal is not to 
make money on the back of creators and sort of like use the gig economy to devalue the whole industry. Our goal is really to convince brands to create more augmented reality content so that there's more money flowing to everybody. Um, also making AR platforms like Facebook and Snap and other ones like more interested in uh, getting brands to do that so that the money can flow. Because right now there are communities, but those guys are not necessarily making money. Like anyone can join the Snap official community. Anyone can apply to the Instagram community. It doesn't mean they're gonna make money. Um, so we're trying to solve that issue. And the way we do that is by making it more affordable for brands and by making the process slightly faster than what a traditional media agency might do. Um, so a lot of the budgets are public. They're on our portal uh, on popular.studio. Whenever we have a live brief, uh, in the beginning we didn't tend to publish those, but now we do. So uh, I don't have the numbers in mind right now, but I think um, for Swan Lake, it's 2,000 pounds, two to 3,000 pounds. Uh, you know, English National Ballet is a small company. They don't have that much money, but we still think it's a super interesting project for whoever, whoever's interested uh, because it's more of like an artsy one. Uh, the King filters tend to go between two and 4,000 uh, pounds in budget. It's been really interesting for most of the creators that have gotten the jobs. I'm going to be really honest. Some creators, some agencies decided not to apply or dropped out because it wasn't enough money for them, and we respect that. Um, however, we found for a lot of creators that sent concept and were interested, it was actually um, a good amount of money and it allowed them to grow their business. Adrian and Batiste in France, uh, thanks to the various briefs that they won, have been able to hire more people and are now sm running a small agency. Uh, some of the freelancers out there, same thing. So I would love to get your feedback on this. And of course, we want to get more information from creators as well, um, see how we position ourselves and, and try to get more money from brands and pay creators as well but we also have to pay ourselves because we have developers who are trying to build a platform and um, having a whole workflow on there we have really big plans on the product side um, where right now we're really managing the service but we want brands to be able to go on the platform and post their briefs themselves so we can get more briefs out there for more creators uh, but yeah if you have more feedback on that please let me know great thanks for that Hey, David, it's Chris. Hey, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I, I generally have questions about how these campaigns have been received by the clients. Like, how are you setting expectations for what the output is going to be? Because, you know, when you're when you're doing Facebook filters or some of these other lightweight interactions, you know, we've been in the AR space for almost almost a decade, but you know, seven, seven to nine years, depending upon which one of us you're talking to. Um, so we're getting a little bit jaded with just the quality. So we have very high expectations. Um, and we try to convey those expectations to our brand clients as well. Like, here's what you should expect. Here's what the output's going to look like at a certain budget. I'm just curious what your brands are sending you as feedback for what they're getting. Yeah, it's just... It's a really, really, really good question. Um, like I said, you know, if anyone wants to give feedback on the call, like I mean, Tommy, you're welcome to as well. But because you, one of the creators on the call who've worked on a project, um, I would say it depends on the client. Um, clients like L'Oreal, for example, that we've worked with, um, are not sufficiently knowledgeable about AR to give very good feedback in terms of the complexity of the lens that they're expecting. So. The people that we work with at L'Oreal were brand managers that have, had never done AR before. I would say their expectation was quite low and they were very happy with the portal and the face filter. And actually, you know, the result is really good also. I would say like the creators did a really good job on that. Um, we, we find that oftentimes we're running a bit short on time in terms of feedback from the client. That, that is one of our pain points where, and probably the creators pain points that we work with too. Um, and why we're using Slack as much as possible. Because some of the clients, like King, on the other hand, are super, super demanding. Um, give a lot of round of feedbacks, even though we try to limit those to two rounds on average. They tend to give more than that. Um, they also have stakeholders internally that are looking at the lens giving feedback. So it takes a long time. like It takes about a week to do sometimes to get feedback from King, which has been painful for both the creators and ourselves because we set these projects to be two to three weeks um, so the creators can plan the next project that they're gonna work on. 
So I apologize for that. Um, Ping is very advanced, like I said. They also tend to copy Snapchat on a lot of the exchanges. So they get feedback on logos, colors, uh, buttons, positioning, the mechanisms. Uh, you know, if it's a mini game, like how fast it's going or not, and how easy it is to collect cropsies or that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, the also the screens, like, is something really important. Like, they're really keen on something working on the majority of screens, which is difficult for us because we don't have the data right now. On what is that? Like, is is eighty percent iPhone seven? I'm just inventing. Obviously, it's not. But like, you know, what is the right amount to cover? Because we know it's nearly impossible to cover every single screen out there. Um, we have gone on very, we feel the pressure like you, I think, to de deliver on very complex concepts. Um, when we're learning now, actually easier concepts sometimes are better. So that's a delicate like thing because you think that a complex concept is going to win you the business. But then a lot of the creators, um, to be honest, have not been always able to deliver on those because they didn't know how to do particular things on Facebook AR Studio or Snap Lens Studio. Um, so for example, syncing music to World uh, Lens is something we've done. Actually, this is just published today. If you want to check it out, I'll also send the QR code. We just published um, a Facebook AR effect for Sigrid. If you check out Sigrid, she's a singer. On her Facebook page, she's promoting it today. Um, and you can find the link hopefully there. So one of our creators did a um, World AR combined with a face filter with the lyrics flying around um, as typography. And it was really, really hard to sync those uh, lyrics with the actual music playing, especially because when you press record, it had to reboot the, the music. And sometimes it got out of sync with Android phones, but not on iOS. Um, and that created major frustration on the client side because they just wanted to launch it. Um, but we've also had issues with the Facebook platform doing some updates um, where we kind of like struggle to catch up all the time. So because we're dependent on those platforms too, it makes it really hard for us to guarantee to the client that we're going to deliver on certain things. Sorry, I'm, I'm renting. I don't know if I answered that question, Chris, exactly, but it is a delicate balance. So. I, uh, maybe I can chip in. So yeah, um, yeah for King, I think at my side, I think you, you guys, uh, were kind of like a firewall for me in there. Uh, so a lot of the feedback of the client didn't didn't affect me much, and you were really great in at filtering it. But I have uh, experience in uh, in cosmetic brands, for example. Uh, I think L'Oreal. Uh, we made a, a lipstick lens uh, some time ago, and they were really, really particular. At, it was like in a previous version of, of Facebook uh, AR Studio, so the the face tracking wasn't all that great. And that was almost um, a deal breaker for them to do uh, because the the lipstick wouldn't wouldn't fit the mouth or uh, it wouldn't it, it it didn't look as as good as they were expecting. They were expecting like a, a carbon copy of their uh, their ads. Uh, I think we lost Tom for a second. So, uh, if you come back, um, feel free to come back in. Let me, uh, if I could just chime in, David. Um, I'll give the the group some quick feedback as well from our campaigns. Um, we definitely tend towards more complicated, just intellectually, and we have found, hands down, that the simpler the experience, the more popular and, and um, engaging it tends to be with, especially with with younger kids or other age groups that maybe are just experiencing AR for the first time. So for sure, simpler has proven itself to be better. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think just to go back to the client, um, with the music labels, like with Sony Music, it was an extremely simple one. If you look at it, um, it's Amelia Monet. It was uh, changing the user from devil to angel. Super simple concept. Brand actually didn't have that much AR knowledge. Again, back to that. Um, so for a lot of those clients, they just want quicker turnaround and something really simple. Um, then you have the Kings. Again, not to sort of like blame them a lot, but yeah, they are just more of a, a complex client who have done a lot of AR and just kind of like expect something. Yeah, Tom. You're yeah. Back. Sorry. 
Uh, we, we lost you midway, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what, how far, uh, uh, what, what you hear, what you hear and what you didn't hear. You were talking about your cosmetics clients. Yeah. Um, well, my experience there was that that was in a, a more, uh, so an older version of Facebook AR Studio. And there, the the face tracking wasn't uh, wasn't the, the the quality it is now, and then uh, it was really hard to um, to convince them that uh, yeah they were expecting like uh, the, the the quality of a of a, of a poster or, or a campaign like the supermodel and the, the lips that the was a, a lipstick brand, and so it was really hard to. Uh, to uh, to manage expectations and uh, convince them of what was possible and what were the limitations of the technology at that point. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was just something I, I noticed. Cool. Um, if I could bring it back to uh, you guys and go back to the subject, which is concepts. Like, yeah, we're trying to understand from your perspective is like how much time you think is needed slash ideal to be able to express interest in a project and like concept something based on what you saw, like the Photoshops or sketches or wireframes or whatnot. Um, from your perspective, Chris, and because you're in a big agency or from Tom's perspective, who's a freelancer, like what what is ideal in terms of turnaround time to send a concept over? Uh, maybe I can start. Um, usually I take, um, I, t I take, uh, a lot of time uh, for the concept, um, but I also tend to uh, sketch immediately in Photoshop uh, as just a way of working. So, um, and that usually, um, well, turnaround time would be a, a day, probably for me, like a one working day. Um, the, I think the the King concept you just uh, uh, showed in the, in the presentation was, I think, a day that was done in a day. Okay. Um, and, and sometimes um, that approach uh, also backfires because uh, the way uh, I present it, like some, sometimes the client confuses it with a, a, a ready-to-go uh, design because it looks um, well. It's formatted a, a certain way, and, and I, I spend some time making it just look great, the presentation of it. And then sometimes they. Uh, it's hard for them to to differentiate between that and a and a final design. Like for me, it's still a concept, and something can change, and and maybe some parts of it still need some polish. Um, but sometimes because of the way I present it, they they uh, they conclude that it's the final design. Okay. That, that's and how do you decide if it's worth pitching or not for a certain project? Um, well, personal interest plays a, plays a, a role for me, if, uh, and and also I some I, I usually uh, tend to pick projects that are have a certain amount of uh, challenge for me. So if I can learn new stuff and raise the bar mys for myself a little bit higher, then then those are the projects I I tend to uh, uh, move towards. And for 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 the king lens, that was. Uh, the gaming element that was really cool. Uh, Got it. Um, yeah. Um, so sometimes during the the concept phase, I also make some prototypes or just test out some technology, and then when I get a sense of well, this will work or I can make this work, then that helps with with the concept. And with other uh, projects, if if I have a great idea, but I'm not sure how to get there. I'm really not sure. Then, then, then sometimes I move away from. It. So I have, somewhere I have to I have to know that I can do it. Thanks, Tom. Um, Chris, do you mind if I ask you what your pitching process is that heavy? Because you, you guys are a big agency. Well, we're we're not really that big. We're just experienced. Um, <laughs> we're we're only five Very people. High quality agency. Then. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, um, you know we are focused on one hundred thousand dollar plus projects. Um, you know we're trying to do a seven hundred and fifty to one point five million dollar project for the Super Bowl right now, a uh, hundred thousand dollar project with Red Bull. So for us, the price is a is a big factor. 
um, and, and in terms of our just our production pipeline, what do we have actually right now? So what's the opportunity cost of trying to drop in on a pitch versus what are we actively working on? Um, and I would say the there's other questions just generally like some of the some of the uh, pitches have requested more elements like tech like working textures or what models are you going to use etc. So the more upfront the work is uh, that they're asking for, the more often we'll probably say uh, we'll we'll wait to the next one. Like we we submitted for the Sigrid filter. Um, but we were able to submit that concept just in the hallway at Augmented World Expo, like in between meeting sessions. So yeah. just doing a, doing a quick sketch on that was was very lightweight and easy for us to say, hey, you know, here's a concept. If you like it, we'll run with it. If not, no harm, no foul. Um, but if, if they're asking for, you know, more fleshed out demos with textures, with models, et cetera. Eh, it, number one, actually, here's a question back to you. Do you have a commitment from the brands? that they're going to pick one yeah. of the submissions regardless? That's a really good question. Uh, and that I think that's what differentiates us from other agencies slash studios with, because we're none of those things. Um, we're really trying to be more of a, a platform and a community. So yes, the answer is yes. We try to get commitment from the brands before we uh, post the brief. Um, so we do have commitment at the moment for every single brief that's on there. Um, we don't like working without commitment from the client because that means the creators are concepting and spending time doing stuff um, and not it's not guaranteed. And obviously, like I think a lot of agencies are used to uh, doing that process and a lot of freelancers who work with brands are used to doing that. But we do consider that your time is valuable and, and we offer 50 pounds for the concept, but we do know it's not a lot of money, obviously, but it's more than nothing. And usually people get nothing. Um, so, so we tend to do that. I mean, I think if a huge brand comes to us tomorrow with a very, very good project and they can't guarantee it until they've seen some concepts and possibly we might consider it, but we would be transparent and we would say on the platform like that this is not guaranteed, uh, basically. But so far, um, you know, all the projects have gone into production. So, um, and Chris, if I can flip back to you for a second, what, what is your concepting process then for those huge projects? It sounds like the client would expect a lot for that amount of money. Uh, it, it really depends on what the end goal of the campaign is. So, uh, for instance, on the really big campaign for the Super Bowl, it's more mission driven as opposed to ROI or metrics driven. So that's more at the loose concept stage. We're not presenting demos. We're not presenting, you know, working wireframes, etc. cetera. Um, but if we're going in with, let's say a Red Bull, yeah, we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a lightweight, what we call model on a marker. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to just throw a 3d model with lightweight anim animations on a trigger image. Um, that's sort of just, you know, cookie cutter work at this point. Um, but it does give some, at least some visualization, uh, one step further than a Photoshop. So it, it's typically um, we'll roll in to the executives with a, a, a white label demo app that just has a, a, a super, super simple um, either model or animated model and say, okay, take this concept, but now expand it further and along these lines, along X or Y lines. Got it. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, does anyone else have any questions? But again, you know, again, like, like we're pitching the government of Colombia, the, you know, the country of Colombia. So we're going after projects that are, you know, many millions of dollars potentially. So it's it's easy for us to spend a week on a demo in that in that scenario versus you know spending three to four days on a demo or selecting textures or finding models, et cetera, for a three to five thousand pound. Uh, experience it's sometimes just it's a harder trade-off for us to make and when you say we like who exactly is involved on the projects uh, our whole team uh, but in terms of skills like is it um, art director creative director yeah, so cre yeah creative director I'm not the creative director one of my partners is um, we've got a technical director and then I'm more of the the project or product manager so doing experience design uh, wireframing etc 
And then who actually develops the project? Our technical director. Okay. So there's three of you on the? Typically on a pitch, it's going to be three. Yeah. Um, if it's early stage, there might be four. We've got a we've got a biz dev guy as well, um, and then we've got separate creative people that are uh, more UI driven, more model driven, etc. But we don't pull those guys in on pitches. Right. Okay. So when it goes into production, then you have other people you're pulling in. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yo, uh, could you tell? Um, so do you have do you guys have insights in in the metrics of how the lenses perform? Because my experience with uh, I'm, I'm I used to work uh, at a media agency and uh, very ROI and uh, metrics driven, and um, the so the recall values uh, of of lenses are are really high, and for certain campaigns the uh, it's, it's really cheap to uh, to. Well, to, to pay for a, a Snapchat lens uh, and to get um, if if uh, recall value is is, is the, the metric you want to uh, uh, base your success on, uh, then uh, a lens is, is is really a cheap way of of, of of getting that result, and that 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 may be a way to increase the the value of what of what, of what we are making for for clients is that. Yeah. Probably um, uh, point out the, that that's really. I don't know if your question for us. Or Chris. Uh, yeah, like I said on on so one thing I would mention is because whoever uh, whoever has access to the page will have access to the insights. Um, oftentimes, uh, the brands might make the creator or popular an editor on Facebook or. Uh, give access to their Snapchat for to upload the the effect, as you know, uh, Tom, and that's the only way for us to get access to that data. So I would say it's really on the brand side. Unfortunately, unless you're working at the brand side, it's it's going to be hard to get that data unless you and Lori. I don't know if he's online. Might have more info, but it's harder unless you have stuff plugged into the effect that is based on your servers where you can put that data on the Facebook side. Um, when we generated the six million impressions on the Big Shack. Effect on Facebook, um, yeah, that was a great piece of information because that's six million impressions for a four thousand pound type thing. So that's mm -hmm. a really good CPM uh, versus some other insights we don't have because, as far as I know, you know, brand recall, all that stuff is going to be measured by the brand, not by the platform. Um, so it's very hard for us to get that data on the Snap side if they do. Uh, media and they have a download now button. Of course, they'll look at the number of app downloads. Uh, William Hill, they were looking at how much money people were depositing into their betting accounts once they've downloaded the app. That that was their metric. So again, mm -hmm. that's going to be measured on the Snap side and the brand side. And we usually try to ask for that data, um, but it's hard for us as creators to get that data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's. The Logical, but that's that probably is a very valuable uh, yeah uh, information for you guys as well. Maybe. Uh, Lori, uh, I don't know if you're on the call or no. I don't think Lori's here because uh, he he found a way for one of them to to host I think a video or something on our servers, and we were able to see how many pings we were getting. That's right. something to think about. Yeah, I think Facebook allows for external uh, textures and stuff, right? so you could uh, yeah you exactly. could make a uh, counter and see how many times. Yeah. You think. Um, yeah, we have two minutes left, so I don't know if anyone else on the call has any questions for us or the creators here. Cool. Well, I might wrap up. Um, and thank you for joining this uh, call. We're gonna. We've recorded it. If you guys are all okay with us posting it on our platform, uh, especially the ones who have talked, uh, we appreciate that. So we could share that with other creators. We're gonna try to have those calls uh, every week or two weeks on various different subjects. If you have stuff you want to talk about, also please let us know. Um, like I said, we have a Slack channel, so please join that and chat with us and the other creators on there, or email me David at Poplar Studio. And I'll be happy to chat about whatever you want. Cool. Thanks again for joining this call. Um, 
and uh, for your questions and feedback.